So when something gets in my head that puzzles me, I just basically marinate on it, ruminate, scratch my mind, think about life, and do a deep dive in research to try to figure out what on earth the problem is. So let's take a look inside this carburetor and then tell you what I learned. I just wanted to bring you along for the ride in case we see anything, you know, noteworthy. On earth, let's get you, I don't even know, I gotta, I gotta get you in here. I don't know what that is, but it does not look good. All right, let's get a close look. It's not good. Uh, I've had this carburetor part recently, and this is just disgusting. I'm not, like, whatever that is, is crusted on there and coming loose. Like, it's, it's bad. So we're gonna do a rebuild on this. Basically take it all apart, clean everything out. Hope the gaskets hold, because the gaskets should be new. But I don't know, can you see the big booger down there? Yeah, that's definitely not things that you wanna see in your carburetor. However, the good news is that we know what our problem is. So that's our good news. All right, so now Project Farm did a wonderful, wonderful episode on this. It's really informative and was able to produce two substances that appear extraordinarily similar to what I found in this carburetor. Uh, it's under a video about fuel stabilizers, not necessarily ethanol and whatever. I'll try to find a link. I don't really know how to do that, but you know, if I can, if I can make it, I'll do that because it's really informative. So the white sludgy stuff came from fuel contaminated with water, and some reaction that had to the aluminum. So that's okay. Let's figure out how we got there. To get there, we need water contaminated fuel. He said a big word like hydroscopic. Project Farm used a big fancy word saying uh, ethanol absorbs water. So, as you know, brake fluid does, I guess ethanol does too. Mystery of this car is we have a polyurethane gas tank. The fuel that was in here, this car hasn't seen a gas station in years. I have tried to put fresh gas in it from gasoline containers to try to put fresh fuel in it every time I ran it or whatever. But those gasoline containers also sat outside and often, you know, not sealed up. So they were also absorbing water. So it's no mystery how an excess amount of water got into this thing. I put that carburetor on there roughly six weeks ago when I did the intake, which led to the wiring problem, which led to getting us back to here to get it running. So what that tells me is, well, I don't know. Hang on. So what it tells me is maximum six weeks, I would say. Well, I don't know. I dumped all the fuel, pumped it all out. It was all yellow and gross and tarnishy. Definitely all ethanol based. Then I put maybe two or three gallons from a can in there. However, in theory, if we still had some water in the line or the gas that I put in from the can had gotten some water in it and all I did was pump that in, could we in theory have allowed that stuff to sit in the carburetor long enough to get the result we got? Because I mean the answer is obviously yes, but the experiment done on Project Farm took nine months. So to continue our Perry Mason adventure here, that potentially explains how the goo got in the carburetor. 
However, if you watch the project farm, the crunchy yellow substance that he is able to get in a jar is a vented jar from the fuel evaporating and leaving just basically its cornflakes behind from its corn fuel. But it does not appear that those two things happen in Congress with each other. Meaning, if you have a dried out situation where the fuel has been over full and dried out, you might get these kibbles in there. On the other hand, if it's contaminated with water and stays somewhat liquidy in a sealed container, then you get the white goo. So how do we have both? This is our mystery. So that carburetor was on my van, which was a daily driver for a long time, and then got intermittently parked, and then more regularly parked, and then eventually just kind of parked. I did put a new carburetor on it and ran the van when I pulled this one off. So the van was, is, I hope, running, and this carburetor was in theory running. But, is that the answer? Is it all the intermittent stuff on the van that led to our crunchies being inside the carburetor, and that's the heating and cooling cycles of the van, because, right, it's a small block as well, plus it's a doghouse, which means you gotta assume that nearly every time that engine stopped with ethanol's lower boiling point it evaporated like mostly some whatever and then every time i took too long to get back to running it more of that buildup could happen so this is where we get into contradictions and fighting words Here's my experience with ethanol fuel, all right? In this particular carburetor, we have both kinds of ethanol-related corrosion and garbage and the symptoms of it, as evidenced by the project farm. We know that to be true. I also run ethanol in this guy. It's never given me trouble, but I sort of favored the blazer all summer. So the fuel in this thing has been sitting for six to eight months at least. Before that, it was the winter. It's probably even longer than that. So moving it in and out of the garage for like recent projects, it's the first time it's actually been started in a while. So I'm getting a rough idle and a stumble and a whatever. Back in the day, I would think that was the points that needed to be filed. That the surface was like corroded up. And that may still be true, but at this point, I'm also pretty sure that fuel has mostly turned and I've got to get some clean stuff through that carburetor if it's not too late already. C10 Daily Driver with the inline six. Ethanol every day since they started making corn fuel. Just because that's what's available around here, never had any trouble with it. Runs right through the carburetor. Carburetor sits right on top of the exhaust manifold. Nothing but ethanol fuel. So, and that's mid 80s fuel injection big blazer nothing but ethanol carbureted daily driver no problems all right so now we have contradictory things here right we've got cars that run great on ethanol and we've got carburetors gummed up by ethanol and damaged proven on you know project farm and in my own experience here so what is it what does that mean so uncle tony says that and i like he knows way more than i do but his assessment was ethanol is great and it cleans out the carburetors and it just evaporates it doesn't leave the varnish and gum that ethanol fuels would leave we're going to talk about that in just a second because when i started building carburetors there was nothing but that stuff happen to have a stack of two barrel carburetors these guys have all been off the road since ethanol fuel so let's take a look inside of one so you can actually see the line where the fuel evaporated down and then eventually was gone. And you, if you look, those horror movie drip lines, all that stuff, that is the varnish and gum and tar that Uncle Tony is talking about. So what of it, man, right? All you had to do is disassemble your carburetor, get your Berryman's Chem Dip, dunk the carburetor body in there and let it soak for a couple of days and that would in fact 
disintegrate and reconstitute the varnish, whatever, whatever word you want to use, that would basically turn the varnish back into a liquid and make it so you could clean it out. The passages would be able to be cleaned with more carb cleaner and compressed air. No big deal, right? Right. Okay, great. So I tried all this stuff on the Edelbrock on the Chevy and none of it made a dent in the corrosion that was left, which was some kind of, is some kind of aluminum oxide. And I think I need to research that a little more, but we tried brake cleaner, carb cleaner, vinegar, mineral spirits, aluminum wheel cleaner, and that chem dip that we just looked at a minute ago. Where is this going? Where does it lead? I don't know, I don't know. So back when I was learning to deal with these things in the early 2000s, Kind of the rule was, and not unlike what Uncle Tony said, if there was no gas in these things, the gas had all turned to varnish and tar and gum and everything was sticky and gooey and it needed to be rebuilt, taken apart, cleaned in a serious solvent to break that stuff apart and get it to move on again. Lately, I have also been watching plenty of stuff on YouTube just like everybody else and on two different channels, Junkyard Digs and Dylan McCool, both seem to experience a situation that they claim was bad fuel sticking valves, so much so that they bent push rods. I believe them. I absolutely do believe it. So, you know, in theory, your ethanol or your non ethanol gas, once it's gone to varnish and gum, it's got some serious sticking power and can make a huge mess for you. However, in my experience, should we get a car in that had one of these carburetors in it and there was still fuel in the bowl, even if it was basically deck stain, disgusting, horrible fuel, that fuel would in fact burn. So you had a chance of just running it and cleaning it out sort of on the car and running fresh fuel through it. If it was totally, totally dry and gummed up, the non-ethanol gas presented pretty serious problems that you had to pull things apart, clean them out, rebuild them, and if the junkyard digs in Dylan McCool assessments are correct, you know, 20 to 40 year old ethanol gas that's still liquid has a chance of tearing up valves? I, I, I don't know. Sure. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. So we gotta draw a conclusion here, fellas. I mean, there's only one and it's relatively obvious. Drive your car, right? Like, that, that solves it. Letting them sit is what's killing it, right? You, we, we know that letting them sit drains the oil out of the top end. If you let it sit long enough, that's no good. The brake rubber parts go bad. All the rubber parts go bad. They like to be driven. The gas goes bad in the carburetor, in the tank, in the fuel pump. You name it, right? There's nothing wrong with the fuel. It'll work in the carburetor or it'll work in fuel injection, both ethanol and non-ethanol. It seems like people have results that way. However, the part that they're all bent out of shape about is when they forget to drive their car or run the lawnmower or do, you know, to do the thing and like yeah you know if you took a trip to the moon and you had to come back between the two fuels what would you rather have in, in your lawnmower or your car probably I'd probably rather have non-ethanol if that's the case but on the flip side if I'm doing sporadic daily driving you know switching cars or letting it sit three weeks month at a time I don't think it makes any difference at all like Maybe do yourself a favor and only put about half a tank in. I don't know if that makes any sense. Maybe it fills up with water faster. I don't really know what the solution is, but it does seem that both fuels work just fine if you drive them. And it really just depends on the circumstance that you let them sit. So I know this is going to drive people nuts because I don't have a definitive opinion on it, but I, I think if I had been driving this car, it wouldn't have had an issue. If I had been driving the van, with the carburetor on it, the carburetor wouldn't have gotten gummed up. I don't even think twice about getting in any of the vehicles that are sitting out in the driveway, firing them up and driving through city traffic. Like, 
and they get nothing but the cheapest corn-based fuel I can buy just because that's all that's available and, you know, 87 octane to get you down the road. So in conclusion, I think both fuels can be detrimental under the right circumstances. And uh, I think avoiding those circumstances is really your best bet. In this particular case, this was a situation where I left ethanol contaminated with water in this carburetor on top of a cold engine. That's it. And before that, I probably left it full, full of ethanol fuel on a blazing hot engine for months. Like it was, it, I drove it home, it was probably extremely hot, full of fuel, I parked it and it probably evaporated as fast as it possibly can. So, and then it never got to cycling clean because it just sat and sat and sat. This is my fault. Would ethanol free fuel have fared better in this carburetor? Possibly, I don't know. Because realistically, the van could have turned it to varnish the way I treated it anyway. Would it have? I don't know. But I would have been in a predicament where I would have had to soak it, hopefully clean out all those little passages just to find out. Just saying, that's, that's my experience. So I'm gonna, we're not, I'm not, you know, we'll just, we're just gonna say everybody is right. I'd love to know what you think, you know, try to keep the comments relatively useful or just, you know, don't, I don't really, you know, whatever, I, I can take it. Uh, but I am curious because this is a problem I would like to avoid and I think that even though I'm telling you that you gotta go drive your cars and all that stuff to keep this from happening, keep fresh fuel in them, I'm super guilty. Like right now, I have three cars that were, are, I'm gonna say are capable of running and driving that I have not driven any substantial amount besides moving them around the yard in over six months. That means I've got bad fuel, I live in a really humid environment, and it's all my fault. I really can't blame the fuel that's in those cars if I have that issue at this point. Because, well, I know better. I know gas goes bad, all gas goes bad. Thanks for any of you that put stuff on YouTube or write anything in the comments, because like really, I'm coming back bringing my own experience based on the stuff I got a chance to think about because it was on YouTube. So, fire away. Until next time, see you guys.